Good morning, everyone, and um, uh, welcome to all of you who are attending in person and for our online listeners. So um, my topic today is on prevention and containment of AMR in our healthcare facilities. Um, but before we get into the crux of the topic, um, I just wanted to mention that the messaging from the WHO on AMR um, awareness and a the fight against AMR is, um, as you can see on the left side, preventing antimicrobial resistance together. And um, as we saw with the World Cup, we know that we are stronger together. So this is not just the uh, functionality of one particular group of healthcare workers, it's everybody's responsibility. And um, so we all need to um, fight against this. And um, I know I'm speaking to the converted because all of you are here to listen to these talks. But um, we know that AMR is the elephant in the room for each of us in our different sectors of work. And um, the big question is, are we close to the post-antibiotic era? And from my perspective, I think we are already in it because we are often seeing patients where we actually uh, thumb sucking what to actually prescribe and what to give and what to advise the clinicians in terms of um, treating that particular microbe. So we are already at the worrisome stage and you know it's time to act. So just in terms of my talk outline, <clears throat> I'd like to provide some surveillance data on our multi-drug resistant escape pathogens, which are, our, which are our healthcare associated pathogens and Clostridium difficile infection rates at um, CMJH. But also just to make you aware, if you're interested uh, you can also find countrywide antimicrobial resistance data. Also, just in terms of um, strategies that we can utilize to reduce AMR in healthcare facilities, including our own, and the AMS strategies that we have implemented as an AMS committee at CMJH. So just in terms of our surveillance data, so what we are doing is laboratory-based surveillance. And we are looking at um, these pathogens, the MDRO escape pathogens, as well as C. difficile, on all sample types, sterile and non-sterile. Um, we deduplicate the data um, uh, based on a, uh, whether it's blood cultures or a, a non-sterile uh, or non-blood culture sample types. Um, so in blood cultures, we would use the, um, the isolates after 14 days of the first isolate. Um, and in non-blood culture samples, it's um, after a month. So that's how, and it's based on CDC guidelines. So in terms of the data that's collected, we are collecting uh, data on carbapenem resistant Enterobacter rallies, the extensively drug resistant A. bomani, extensively drug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa, ESBLs, Colistin resistant GNBs, because as we know, colistin is our salvage drug, and we want to know what to what extent are we getting colistin resistance. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, vancomycin resistant Enterococci, Candida auris, because we know that's a Candida species that is multi drug resistant, and Clostridium difficile. Okay. So, in terms of our rates, so as you can see with CRE rates, and this is essentially from the, for starting from January of 2023 to October um, or the last month of 2023. Um, so essentially with the CREs, you can see that we are sitting more or less at a rate of between two, around two per thousand patient admission days. But you can see in the last three months, our rates have been escalating. So we have had some sporadic outbreaks in some of the units, and some of you may know which are those units I'm talking about. Um, in terms of our extensively drug-resistant A. Bomani, we're sitting around 1.3 per thousand patient admission days, pretty stable, and extensively drug-resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa, very low rates, which is a very good, very good sign from our side. So between 0.1 to 0.2 per thousand patient admission days. In terms of ESBL organisms, um, again, we are sitting um, uh, more or less on a stable frame between 1.4 to 1.5 per thousand patient admission days. Our cholesterol resistant isolates have been actually um, on a, uh, have been low. And I'm happy to also report that since June, we've actually had very low rates. So 
possibly one or two per month. So that's very good. Um, the candida auris rates also in our hospital are relatively uh, much lower compared to other government sector hospitals and private sector. So you can see there it's around 0.1 per thousand patient admission days. <clears throat> Um, Clostridium difficile, um, and you'll see in a later slide, is our, our problem. And um, often we see, again, sporadic outbreaks in units. Um, and currently we are sitting with uh, an escalation of our rates. So we're sitting at about 6.2 per 10,000 patient admission days in the month of October. Uh, MRSA and VRE rates are very low. So I just want to draw your attention to this because in some units, when we go to do IPC audits or AMS ward runs, we see that they have empiric cover for gram-positive organisms, such as vancomycin for MRSA cover. But please take note and please request from us microbiologists your antibiogram so that you're, you're made aware of your, of your epidemiology and your your data on these gram-positive organisms. We are not seeing MRSA in big numbers in our hospital. Okay, so just in terms of descending order of the predominant multidrug resistant organisms at CMJH, number one would be C. difficile, as you can see, as you've seen in the data, CREs, ESPL, and extensively drug-resistant Abomani. So these are our top, top four pathogens. And just in terms of countrywide data, if you just want to know what is happening beyond our institutions, uh, public sector healthcare, uh, public sector data is provided by the NICD dashboard. And you can go into the NICD website, which, uh, which the link is provided there, and just look for the dashboard icon. And if you go in there, you can get the public sector data. So just to make, just to take note that the escape pathogen data is, is only for blood culture isolates. Okay, so it's not all sample types. It's only for blood culture isolates. And their deduplication is slightly different from the CDC guidelines in that they are using a 21-day cutoff period for the blood culture isolates, not a 14-day cutoff period. And you will find data per province. So, um, and essentially they are depicting their data not per 1,000 patient admission days or 10,000 patient admission days. It's based on uh, percentage susceptibility or percentage resistance, which is more useful on a broader scale. In terms of the private sector data, um, it, is, it is available on the FITSA website under the SASCOM surveillance data. And um, we are at the moment working towards trying to bring the both data together onto one platform. Um, it's just that we're having uh, issues with IT and getting that IT support, but it is being looked at. Into. But at the moment, these two websites can provide you with AMR data countrywide. And also just the private sector data is also on only blood culture isolates of the escape pathogens. So just in terms of the framework, sorry, I think my slides just moved around a little bit. But just in terms of the framework for the prevention and containment of AMR. So this framework essentially came from a guideline document, um, which is a local guideline document from the Department of Health that was published in 2018. And I thought this was quite useful. Um, so the framework consists of three main components, IPC, AMS, and healthcare work worker training. And this should be geared towards behavioral change. So any of us training on AMS and proper uh, antimicrobial prescribing should be gearing our training towards behavioral change. And that will start at an undergraduate level and go forward. So in terms of IPC, there are three uh, main bundles, uh, sorry, three main pillars uh, under IPC. And I just want you to also take note that um, under each of the pillars, there are different strategies uh, and examples of strategies. And you will see there are ticks next to them. So the ticks are suggesting what we are striving to implement or have implemented in our hospital at CMJH. And you will see that some of the ticks are smaller than others, 
meaning the strategy has not been effectively implemented. Okay, there is still not enough buy-in on those strategies. So if you look at IPC, the first pillar is trying to prevent and control the spread of infections. So um, how do we do this? Obviously, good hand hygiene practices, the use of appropriate PPE or personal protective equipment um, for the transmission-based precaution, the appropriate transmission-based precautions. If you're dealing with contact versus airborne versus droplet, using the right PPE. Isolating patients, and where you can't isolate, cohorting patients with the same infection together. Appropriate equipment cleaning mm -hmm. and appropriate environmental cleaning. So these are just some of the IPC strategies. And you can see that our IPC team at this hospital is very active um, and um, you know they're trying to train around this as well as implement this in conjunction with IPC champions in the various wards. So please do cooperate with them. The second, uh, uh, the second pillar is use, using bundle interventions against healthcare associated infections. So your healthcare associated infections like your ventilator associated pneumonia, surgical site infections, your catheter associated UTIs, your uh, central line related bloodstream infections. So they are bundles of inter intervention. So instead of waiting for an outbreak to happen, an infection outbreak to happen, and then to react to it, there are proactive measures one can take to try and prevent those infections. And that's where these bundles of interventions come in. So if you have, a, and the best care always provides these bundles and best care always is evidence-based. So there's a lot of literature to, to suggest that it works. So you implement a bundle if you know a patient is on a central line or is on a, a having a urinary catheter, et cetera, or on a ventilator, et cetera. And you can see that my tick next to it is small because although there has been a lot of training around this in this hospital and even uh, BCA champions were identified in the various wards, the buy-in has been low. And staff seem to think it adds to their workload. But you need to understand that preventing these infections actually decreases your workload in the long term and your patient admission days. So this is something we actually need more support with in regards to from, from heads of departments, operational managers. The best care always bundles. Then the third pillar is monitoring and evaluating your rates of multi-drug resistant in, uh, organisms, as well as your healthcare associated infections. So this can be done either manually or through an automated system. In our setting, it is being done manually by uh, the laboratory, as I mentioned, but obviously automation, and there are automated programs such as your Bluebird system, your ICNET, and this, this is something that we have been fighting for. It's more efficient. Um, aside from just providing surveillance data, you can draw reports immediately within minutes if you have it done in an automated fashion. Unfortunately, the issue for us has been cost, cost uh, issues, cost related issues, but this is something we need to be moving towards. When it comes to AMS, um, the three pillars are management, governance, and consistent oversight. So unfortunately, we often have to um, follow up on people's AMS activity. And that is important. I mean, that, that, that kind of oversight is important from individuals who are working in the various areas. Everybody, like I said, it has to be responsible for AMS. Um, so oversight will come from hospital management and our hospital management does support us a lot with our AMS activities. The AMS committee, um, which many of us are part of and which is quite active, as well as AMS champions. You need to have AMS champions in your wards to drive AMS. And we have some ex exceptional people in some of our wards who are driving AMS um, within their areas. So that, that is really encouraging. Facility level interventions. So for instance, as an AMS committee, we have introduced um, various activities which are all ticked there, you can see. So there is pre-prescription authorization 
and I'm sure many of you have utilized the, the phone, the, the on-call list, um, the after hours lists for pre-prescriptions, uh, prospective AMS ward rounds. So these ward rounds, we have certain set areas that we go to. So all the ICUs, the high care areas are covered. But when we see, for instance, increasing uh, drug resistance in certain areas, or we see increasing consumption of broad spectrum antibiotics, as an AMS committee, we may decide to actually start AMS ward rounds in those areas. So those are prospective AMS ward rounds, which we are doing. Um, surveillance on prescribing practices. So um, we the pharmacy does have some oversight on in terms of the prescriptions that are going to the pharmacy. And they do, when they have students, they, have, they also do try to audit the prescription charts. We're not doing it as often as we should, but you know, um, there is some oversight from the pharmacy side. The global PPS survey, which uh, Antinet will go into, which was conducted this year for us. <clears throat> we also have institutional prescribing guidelines. So these have been um, already uh, finalized for community acquired infections. Excuse me. <laughs> Um, apologies, everyone who's listening in. Um, sorry, um, in terms of there was a connection issue, um, apologies. So if SOPs have also been um, have, have also been created for our institution, we also provide antibiograms if you if you require it to understand your epidemiology as well as AMS training. And I'll just briefly touch on that a bit later. In terms of patient level interventions for AMS, and this is at the clinician nursing level. So only to use antibiotics for a bacterial infection, culturing before administering antibiotics to the patients. It's very critical to identify and to identify your source of infection and implement effective source control to choose an appropriate empiric antibiotic. So please, you need to determine, is it a community acquired infection versus a healthy associated infection? Is your empiric antibiotic going to um, have adequate tissue penetration? Um, does it target your most likely organism at the site? Um, is it associated with more allergies or toxicity? And base it on the aware list, which I'll just uh, go on to in the next slide. Also, 
daily one needs to evaluate the four Ds. So delivery, dose, duration, and de-escalation of therapy from uh, based on your cultural results. So <clears throat> these are all some of the pillars of AMS. Okay, and then just uh, very briefly, the WHO has provided the AWARE classification of antibiotics when choosing antibiotics. You can see the, the green uh, list are the access antibiotics. These are associated with a good safety profile and not associated with um, aggravation of antimicrobial resistance. Most of these agents are easily accessible and are part of the EML list. The watch uh, antibiotics should be conserved uh, and only limited for specific uh, and only used for specific indications. Um, and the reserve is obviously your salvage antibiotics, the ones you want to conserve uh, and use sparingly only for your extensively drug resistant organisms. Um, the, the last component of the framework is healthcare worker teaching and training. And this is done through in-service IPC training for which our IPC staff are always available. So if you need to reach out to them, if you feel IPC is an issue in your units, please do reach out to our IPC team, um, as well as in-service AMS training. And I will mention what we are, what the AMS course that we are offering at CMJH. So the additional strategies implemented for AMS, aside from the ones I've already mentioned, include the updated antimicrobial prescription chart, which has also been circulated to the Gauteng AMS committee. And they have also tried to circulate this further on into the private sector. So that, that's how useful this chart has become. And you know, we were the you all were the pioneers of using that chart. So please do continue to use it. Um, setting up of an electronic prescribing, which clearly will reduce hang time for patients in terms of getting their antibiotics from the time of prescription. And at the moment, this is currently being used in our outpatients department and with regards to our restricted antibiotics. But the plan is to um, expand it into inpatients as well. Um, the AMS committee WhatsApp group, which is very useful in terms of communicating any areas of concerns, um, such as unusual increases in prescriptions of broad spectrum antibiotics in specific areas, et cetera, or stockouts. But additionally, the pharmacy also sends out a weekly email on antimicrobial stockouts. So that also gives everybody in the hospital an idea of what we will be dealing with for the following week. And we can always look at alternatives uh, that would be ideal. <clears throat> So I'm not going to go into the prescription chart, but I just wanted to say, please utilize this, the antimicrobial prescription chart for any antimicrobial agent. Um, so we're not talking other drugs, we're talking antimicrobial agents, because it is very quite descriptive and it kind of guides you in terms of how you should be thinking when you're prescribing your antibiotics. So I'm just going to fly through that. And then the last thing I just wanted to talk about was the CMJH AMS course. So um, you can see that um, if you are interested in attending this course, if you are a clinician, a microbiologist, pharmacist, anybody in fact who is involved in antibiotic prescription or administration can attend this course. And you may contact Dr. Sarah Stacy. Uh, the next course will most likely be around May of 2024. So the course is um, open to all healthcare staff, as I've mentioned. It is in a hybrid format with pre-recorded lecture videos, online quizzes, and four, only four in-person sessions. Um, this is because we need to have some contact with the participants to know what the uptake of information is like. So unfortunately, there has to, it was it was decided to go into a hybrid format. The course is run over five weeks. And the in-person sessions are done on a Tuesday afternoon from 1 to 4 p.m. And these include critical care ward rounds, case discussions, as well as the online quiz discussions. So, yeah, um, and attendance of these in-person activities is mandatory. <clears throat> so the online quizzes and assignments not only help the trainees, 
but also help the trainers to understand the uptake of information. Um, and the content falls under five themes. So, so we discuss some diagnostics, some microbiology, antibiotic usage, management of the critically ill patients, antibiotic use in specific settings, um, infection prevention and control aspects, and how one could implement an AMS program. So the whole idea of the course is to train the trainer and the trainer then will go forward and train others. So together we can make a difference and please become an antibiotic guardian and keep our antibiotics working. Thank you for this. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the privilege to speak this morning. I'm going to um, show you more about the results of the global when prevalence study that was conducted in October this year at um, Charlotte Mokeke Hospital. The outline um, is what is a point prevalence study, global point prevalence uh, and the purpose of it, uh, features as well as the standardized surveillance tools and why, and data collection challenges, GBPS feedback report, GBPS um, comparison report between 2017 and 2023, a short summer summary and the next step. So what is a point prevalence survey? According to the CDC definitions, it's a collection of data um, used to identify the number of people with a disease or condition at a specific point in time. So it is a snapshot. So we took October as the snapshot shot. We, we uh, conduct a survey during October. So it's in one point of time. So most of the time the hospitals calculate new infections. So what is the amount of new infections for October or for November? So it's a little bit different. So um, the purpose of the GPP is, is to um, monitor rates and antimicrobial uh, prescribing and resistant bugs in the hospital, organisms in the bar hospital. We benchmark between the hospital countries and the region. So you will see the results that we've got back is a comparison between what your hospital, what the um, Africa continent, and um, then Europe is. So you will see the comparison now. Identification targets. So we see, okay, our targets for 2017 were higher than now, but we need to um, set targets for next year. So we use the results for that. Identify targets uh, to prevent in intervention related healthcare associated infections. And um, I am going to um, look into the um, healthcare associated infections as well and show you a little bit of results there. Um, the, the, uh, we will also assess effectiveness uh, from the effectiveness of the AMS committee from 2017 to 2000 and now, uh, 2023. So let me see. The features of the global point prevalence is to standardize. Um, sustainable um, survey method. Um, it is for inpatients and outpatients. We are only focused on inpatients this year. Uh, it's a web-based tool, so and it um, also assure quality by validation um, of the system, and then feedback reports. Um, the institution builds um, up and own um, standardized database on HAIs, AMS prescribing and resistance, and remain owner of the database. And therefore, this facilities can repeat this GPPS yearly. And in Europe, it is part of their quality improvement audits yearly. Then the global um, point prevalence uh, standardized surveillance tool is there to assess and monitor antimicrobial use, resistance, and uh, healthcare-associated infections. 
uh, provides real-time standardized feedback reports and benchmarking between um, national and regional, regional measure effectiveness of interventions so you can um, repeat the global PBS. Challenges that we had when we've done the uh, global PBS in the units. It's not all the units, but um, it will really it take time if we need to um, search for weight and plots that's not written down and antibiotic charts that's not being done. So some of the wards not using the new antibiotic charts. And now Dr. Tina told you it's very important to use it because it makes a uh, really a difference. You can um, you will see uh, in the results that I'm going to explain to you now. So the feedback reports um, is based on all these items and feedback, but there's not enough time for me to go into each one. So I will just go a little bit in antimicrobial prevalence uh, report back, um, HII prevalence, um, target and empirical use, and surgical prophylaxis. So it is a comparison study. So um, I need to congratulate Charlotte Mokeke Hospital. There was a reduction in antimicrobial use between current and the previous survey. And you can see um, it is really a reduction. It's only um, the children antibiotic use that went up. Then um, the proportional antibiotic use, um, it also, all the green is um, uh, where um, the antibiotic use decreased and the red is where it increased. Now you can see, Dr. Tina said say to us in the previous lecture, there was carbapenem outbreaks um, in the hospital. So you can see the carbapenem use increased to 12.8%. So um, it is in line with what the previous speakers talked about. Then um, the types of antibiotic treatment, the summary. So here is our um, empiric treatment and targeted treatment. There's also a downward or a decrease shown in the slide, but here we need to um, decide from the AMS committee, uh, what can we done um, to to do more targeted treatment and to be more effective on targeted treatment. For example, then around time of um, specimens in the laboratory or doctors that wait for the um, results before starting with antibiotics. Then the proportional antibiotic use um, and um, healthcare-associated infections. At the right top, you can see treatment based on antimicrobial data. So there you can see during October with the point prevalence study, there was um, uh, patients with um, uh, resistant organisms um, culture. And then you can see the carbapenem use from 2017 was 16.5. And now in 2023, it's 26.2. So with all the outbreaks, the carbapenem increase, but you can also see the HIRs is 8.2, the percentage. So we need to look at um, healthcare associated infection guidelines. The, the um, proportional antibiotic use for surgical uh, prophylaxis um, I think we are doing good in that, and um, the choice of antibiotic is is um, is your first like generation cephalosporins. So um, yeah, you can see that the choice of antibiotic is good, but we are using it for more than three days. So um, we need to just change that we are having more green than red in this slide in, 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 in future. So there is it's coming in the implementation, the following up and, and the maintenance of the antibiotic um, surgical prophylaxis guidelines maybe. 
So the summary of quality indicators of antibiotic use, um, here is here you can see the results of your antibiotic scripts. Um, on the antibiotic scripts, you can see there is reason on notes. They stop uh, stop dates. These dates when the um, the antibiotic was started. So um, the the new script will be maybe uh, in future. Um, reviewed but that is really it helps you can see it out of the of the results of the gpps as well then prevalence of healthcare associated infections uh, um, hospital wide here we look at guidelines of healthcare associated infections is it really necessary what must we incorporate in um this um guidelines and then here you can see the infection rate from 2017 decreased from 9.7 to um, 8.2. But here again, you can see an increase in the um, Clostridium difficile admissions that is 0.8. It's the rate. So um, to use these guidelines, is um, you need to know the intervention-related infections. And intervention-related infections is your CVPs, uh, your intubations at uh, uh, with your um, uh, uh, your your ICU patients. And then you can see that is where the the uh, numbers coming from. Other hospital infections is bloodstream infections. Um, VAP infections and your um, urinary tract infections. So um, we are using a lot of CVPs in the hospital. It is a, a 64, um, it, it doesn't seem like it's a lot, but all the ICUs use your CVPs and we need to get that out as, as soon as possible. And then um, your VAP infections also with the intubation and the intubation time of the patient. So you can, you can and the guidelines will be written according to this. Then um, prevalence of missed doses in the hospital and hospital-wide, stop out was the biggest problem um, during the uh, global point prevalence study. So we need to think what we can do um, to maybe eradicate stop outs, but it's very difficult. So 44 more hospitals in Africa joined the GPPS during the October to December survey. Um, overall prevalence of antibiotic use in adults and pediatric patients decreased compared to 2017. Overall proportion of antibiotic use in um, hospital reduced in all uh, classes, except for the third line generation, kefirosporins and um, carbapenem use. Increase in target treatment was seen in the current survey compared to the previous surveys. And the choice of surgical uh, prophylaxis was uh, appropriate, uh, but the derivation needs to be reduced. So um, the hospital therefore need now to take a step further and we need to look into from the um, antibiotic stewardship side, what are we going to do to reduce um, the, to reduce um, maybe the carbapenem, um, the carbapenem use. So guidelines needs to be um, re-looked at and reviewed. Um, maybe what can we do to um, target um, uh, to, uh, um, target treatment, what can you do to eradicate stock up? So thank you to all of the participants and the support of the AMAs um, for the um, global PBS. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, I'll say good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Tahir, I'm from the pharmacy. And basically, we're going to give you a brief overview of what does the pharmacist do in antimicrobial stewardship. So since the theme is uh, better together, I've decided to 
volunteer some of my staff to join me in this talk and just to cover the different aspects that we do as the farmer scene and my workshop. Okay, good morning. I'm Yasin. Uh, I'm a pharmacy intern. So it is my supervisor. That's why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to go through why AMS is so important from a pharmaceutical perspective. So we all know that antimicrobial resistance is directly related to our prescribing patterns. And there was a study that was done in the tertiary hospital, much like ours in Saudi Arabia, where they checked how inappropriately antibiotics are prescribed and pre and post the AMS intervention, um, they found that more than 79% of antibiotics are inappropriately prescribed. So inappropriate prescribing is a problem. Uh, then the second reason why AMS is so important is because having an effective AMS um, strategy in plan definitely reduces cost. So I'd like to focus on the first study on this slide where it says that 28% of antimicrobial expenditure can be decreased within the first year of an AMS program. So this study was done in South Africa uh, in a public hospital. It was done in 2013, I think. So it was carried out in Cape Town at Kroetiski, where they implemented a four-year AMS program. And within the first year already, they saw a 28% decrease in antimicrobial expenditure. And then obviously the last and perhaps the most important reason why an AMS program is so important is because of resistance. So we all know what resistance is, but do we really understand how big the problem is? So there was a study done by, I think it was Pfizer, and they came to the conclusion that if we do not put in effective AMS strategies, by 2050, the deaths due to resistant microbes could exceed 10 million per year. And then a bit closer to home in South Africa, um, we're already seeing patients who are resistant to every single antibiotic that we do have available. And the first one of these patients was seen as early as 2011, where there was a patient once again in Cape Town um, with Klebsiella pneumonia that was resistant to all the antibiotics available at the time. So the possibility of a post-antibiotic area is upon us. And then even closer to home at Simja, um, while we were preparing for this presentation, we analyzed our average monthly consumption data for our restricted antibiotics like digocycline, mycofungin, and colistin. And we saw a steady increase in all of these restricted antibiotics. The most concerning was colistin, where it increased more than threefold from February to March this year. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Shanice von Skalpik. I'm a pharmacist at Simja. Um, Tyler was my one of my supervisors during my internship. That's why I am now dragged into this a few years later. <laughs> Not that I mind being here. Absolutely love it. So I'm just gonna discuss. <laughs> so I'm just gonna discuss basically the role of a pharmacist. So in order for us to promote optimal use of antibiotics, the pharmacist becomes an integral part of the AMS team because they are equipped with or should be equipped with. Of, uh, knowledge on optimizing dosing, routes of administration, and duration of therapy. Pharmacists can also flag if there will be any drug-drug interactions or drug-disease interactions that a patient might experience. The goal of pharmacy is ultimately to ensure that the patient receives the safest medication that is the most effective for their drug, for their disease or um, state. So, the question on everyone's mind, including mine, is do pharmacists actually make a difference? Well, I won't speak biasly, but I'll refer to some research that was done. In hospitals with pharmacists, according to one article, pharmacists managed um, aminoglycoside and vancomycin therapy. They saw a, decreased, a decrease in death rates and also a shorter length of stay in comparison with hospitals who do not have pharmacists as part of their team. In another study, a pharmacist-driven initiative targeting low-hanging fruit, which is our day-to-day -day, um, orally administered antimicrobials, so uh, in South Africa, in 47 of our hospitals, resulted in a reduction in antibiotic-defined daily dose. And then in terms of cost saving, because we know we deal with major budgetary constraints in the public sector, so there was an organization in the U.S. that after in two years after implementing a pharmacist-driven AMS program, 
um, saw a decrease in their cost by an estimated 300,000 USD, slightly more, but this was without the support of an IB physician. That's why we are so keen on working in collaboration because imagine how much they could have saved if they had actually had a multidisciplinary team working together on this. Okay, so the pharmacist plays a couple of roles in antimicrobial stewardship because they have the ability to tailor advice to specific um, or different specialties and departments. Pharmacists are expected to have a knowledge of microbiology, pharmacokinetics and dynamics, and the pharmacotherapy of different drugs, amongst other things. And then pharmacists as part of ward rounds can provide advice on whether an appropriate uh, if whether an antibiotic is required, what the most appropriate would be, and then the um, dosage and duration at which it should be taken. This will also benefit us as pharmacists because in the healthcare sector, we are constantly learning. So having a pharmacist as part of your team will not only benefit the team, but the pharmacy as well. Um, learning about new pathogens, new diseases, new uh, treatment guidelines that could be implemented at our hospital. Then advising other healthcare professionals on medication regimens and durations of treatment. So this goes with our continued professional development. As you know, all of us should be involved in it. Pharmacists can provide um, training and education on the different uses of drugs, how it should be administered, and quite frankly, anything else drug related that the hospital does require. So contributing to medication formularies, I know that we are in the process of developing a formulary for our hospital, but it is quite a lengthy process. So your pharmacist would be there to ensure that current evidence-based guidelines are translated into local decision-making tools. So whether you are introducing something to your formulary, making changes, or just developing the formulary itself, your pharmacist would be an integral tool to your team in that regard. And then as much as we'd like to believe that we have a solid team of healthcare professionals working together, we could have the most perfect scenario where Micro has received the cultures ASAP, we've uh, prescribed and dispensed the appropriate drug for the patient. But if the patient is not adequately counseled and educated on why they are using their drug and how to use their drug, it all fails in the end. So we need to ensure that there is constant patient counseling and patient education initiatives happening in the hospital so that we equip the patients with the ability to take their own health into their health into their own hands to some extent. And then contributing to surveillance measures in the pharmacy, we do identify and report trends in antimicrobial usage, which is an ongoing thing that could be strengthened in future. We are hoping to do that in the coming year since we have a much stronger team. And um, so this goes with doing ward rounds, getting involved in not only the wards, but also our outpatient departments where we check the day-to-day -day trends and what is available in the hospital. Also looking at um, the drug availability in the pharmacy and how to better improve that. Um, so I promise both of them really wanted to be here. Uh, so what are the activities that we do at Simja? So just to highlight, there are other hospitals who might do more than us, some do a bit less, uh, but these are the activities that we currently do. So pre-authorization, I think Dr. Thomas touched on that. That's basically the uh, antimicrobial prescription chart. We've got a formulary restriction. There's a set of restricted antimicrobials. And you require pre-authorization before prescribing them. Uh, and the purpose of that is not just to be a policeman and say, no, you, you have to get the authorization for it. There's a thought process behind it. Are you using the right drug at the right dose for the right patient at the right time? Uh, and I think that's something that needs to be emphasized. And there are other strategies. We've got something called uh, prescription uh, order and direct intervention and feedback which is less restrictive, but less effective. That does give the prescriber more autonomy and where you get a suggestion. Are you really sure about this antibiotic or how do you feel about it? But that um, the prescriber doesn't have to comply to those restrictions. Procurement. So this ranges from your basic antimicrobials, your augmentin, your penicillin. Uh, but what I'm going to focus on is more the procure procurement of the more difficult to source drugs, your section 21 drugs. 
Um, that would be identifying suppliers, uh, guiding prescribers on how to fill out Section 21 forms. I know that's something that's always a bone of contention. Why do I need to fill out this form? Uh, what's the purpose of it? Why is it not available? There's financial issues with that. We know the global situation. Uh, most drugs are from China and India. Um, and SAFRA, which is our regulatory authority, doesn't have oversight over them. So there is sort of... Uh, putting it back into the prescriber's court also. Uh, are we sure that we really want to give this drug to the patient? We don't have much authorization or say on are these drugs being controlled? Uh, and also antimicrobials that are not in the EML. So we've got different levels of the essential medicine. Like you've got your primary care, you've got your tertiary, you've got your quaternary, and there's restrictions on each level. So we guide prescribers to tell them, are they on this level of the EML? Um, and what are the measures to try and get them on the EML and how to get it approved for our institution? For example, so a member of the EMS committee and part of the PTC, and I guide prescribers to, to help them to get their drug motivated, uh, motivated by the PTC. So remember, if it's not on the EML, um, you need to provide strong evidence. So studies, uh, cost analysis, why your drug would be of benefit and why is it better than a drug currently on the, on the EML. And we know with antimicrobials resistance is a big issue. So it's, it's often a lot of antimicrobials that can get onto the EML, but for various reasons, maybe they don't get on there. Very, uh, people haven't applied to the EML committee or there's just not enough data presented to them. And also the newer agents like uh, KSAV, Kefteroline, not necessarily the novel agents, but agents that we might not have in the public sector. So you might get them in the private sector, but then haven't yet entered into the realm of the prior of the public sector. Antibiotic ward inspection. So basically, this is where the pharmacists get into the ward and they inspect the medicine rooms or the usage of antimicrobials in the wards. Uh, in particular, emphasis is played on agents like colistin, tigercycline, and microfungal. So what we would do. For example, if we, we know a particular ward has been getting colistin, we'll send the intern or one of our pharmacists to go and check the colistin in, in the ward. So does what you have in the ward match up to the patients that you send to pharmacy? Uh, is there enough stuff for one patient or do you have stuff for 50 patients? Um, and the, the reason behind it is obviously, is the drug being used appropriately? Has the patient been discharged? Has therapy been de-escalated? Has the patient demised? And for agents like Section 21, having that extra stock, it's convenient for the ward, but it doesn't follow the process. You've not got authorization. You don't have a Section 21 form. And that does have implications, both for resistance, for antimicrobial stewardship, and for legal as well. Um, remember, the Section 21 document does have legal implications. You are getting informed once and from your patient, and you are telling them, this is, I feel that this drug is safe for you even though there is a caveat that it's not registered in South Africa, which is something that we often ignore. And it's where the pharmacy comes to check if the colistin is there in the world, is it actually there for a reason? Okay. And uh, it's actually, actually these efforts have shown quite a big difference, especially with agents like tigercycling and microfungal, which we monitor every month and usage has dropped quite a bit. And then antimicrobial surveillance, which we've touched, uh, touched on, we've got the RX system, which monitors usage. Um, we can monitor what the inpatient department has been ordering. And we are also looking at ways to sort of strengthen that procedure and look at specific walls and specific units. But as you know, IT can be an issue and we are trying to improve that as well. Then future projects, so establishing an EMS team. So we have an EMS committee in the hospital, but we're trying to get an EMS team, which we've in the early stages of in the pharmacy, uh, and that forms part of a clinical committee. So we won't just be focus, focusing on antimicrobial stewardship, but we'll be looking at pharmacovigilance uh, and ways to improve clinical pharmacy in the hospital. Unfortunately, we are a big academic institution, but we don't have clinical pharmacists. Some of you might have encountered clinical pharmacists, and I'm a big uh, advocate for that, but unfortunately, we don't have that. Uh, if you look at countries like the UK and US, you've got clinical pharmacists who are specialized. They are board certified, ID pharmacists, oncology pharmacists, pediatric nephrology pharmacists, and it makes sense. If your unit has a specialized nurse, you've got consult, why not have a pharmacist who specializes in, in that area as well? A lot of us are generalists, but 
it would be nice if your pharmacist is basically a walking sim, walking textbook, giving you the doses, which they are in America and the UK. Uh, that would be ideal. They're experts in pharmacokinetics, um, dosing and those kinds of things. So that's something that in South Africa we'd like to have. And there are clinical pharmacists in South Africa and, and they do fantastic work. So that's the plan for us to get clinical pharmacists here. Ward rounds, and that would be actually joining into the grand ward rounds, the teaching ward rounds, being part of that. I'm sure most of you have never seen a pharmacist on any of those, maybe once or twice. I know I've only been like maybe on a few. Uh, unfortunately, that is a HR issue and also sort of bureaucratic issues. Um, it's up to us to show the value of pharmacists being there. Um, it's not just on relying on management or HR to get clinical pharmacists. So it is a bit of our issue as well, but we're trying to get that to happen. And then that would lead to pharmacists going into the wards and checking the prescriptions there. Because unlike an OPD prescription where the pharmacist is seeing the prescription, we don't always see the inpatient prescription. We're not monitoring therapy. Uh, and actually, in, if you are a ward pharmacist, you can actually counsel the patient, ask them about side effects. Sometimes patients are actually scared to speak to their clinicians. They speak uh, scared to speak to their sisters. They might tell the pharmacists more about their side effects. And we actually notice that. And they'll say like, oh no, I've got this rash or I've got a headache or something's not right. So uh, it's, it's also something that we would like to get into as well. And then the OPD AMS initiative. Unfortunately, there's no real AMS that uh, get it out at the outpatient level. And the aim of this is basically to get an idea what's the picture, what's, what's happening there, who's prescribing the most antibiotics, which units are using it, what indications, are they using it for the right indications, right durations, uh, and it's something that we'd like to do. I don't think, to my knowledge, there's no actual hospital that does that. I don't know if they do it in private. I know in community pharmacy that doesn't really happen. Uh, and actually, when I mentioned it to one of my colleagues, and they were like, no, no, what's the point? But this is actually something we should get into. Um, because resistance, I feel, also starts at the community level. Okay, then education drives. Um, these would be pharmacist-driven education drives regarding antimicrobial use for both patients and for healthcare professionals. And this would be starting from your very surface level knowledge, what is antimicrobial resistance? Uh, what is the implications of it? Um, do you have to finish your course? Uh, we know that's something that everyone, that was the mantra that we always had, you must finish your course. But right? some evidence says you don't necessarily, necessarily have to do that. Um, other aspects that we would look at at education would be, obviously, your pharmacology, um, reconstitution of antimicrobial, which the nursing staff needs some assistance of. That's where our pharmaceutical and chemical knowledge comes into. If you reconstitute any, any antibiotic, is it stable for six hours versus 72 hours? And uh, infusion rates and administration queries as well. And pharmacokinetics, where you actually have specialists in pharmacokinetics. So your therapeutic drug monitoring for vancomycin and those agents. And these would be various levels of education. Like I said, from the very basic level to more technical. And it's something that we've begun and we want to grow as well. Okay, and then we've got a dedicated team. That's basically our inpatients department. That's the extension. If you have any queries, um, so you get maybe one of us and then one of my uh, our, my colleagues, Nazrana, who's unfortunately not able to attend. She's our inpatient pharmacist. And if you have any queries with regards to antimicrobials, uh, whether it be availability, uh, like I said, stability issues, uh, dosing, um, getting hold of an authorized prescriber, you can call this extension and we can assist you to the best of our abilities. Um, like Dr. Thomas said, we've got a WhatsApp group here as well. And sometimes if we're not sure, we drop a question in there, one of the authorized prescribers will respond to us. Um, and we've made actually quite a good use of it over the years and it's quite helpful and there's no harm in asking. Um, whether you are a nurse, a clinician, a pharmacist is always good to ask. Um, and yeah, that's that's the area that you can call. And yeah, it's all the contributors. Thank you so much, guys.
Morning, everyone. I realize we're running out of time, and so I'm going to be quite quick. As you can see, there's quite a team of people that can help you with AMS issues. So we've obviously got our IPC team, we've got us infectious disease specialists, we've also got our pharmacy team, and then obviously our microbiologists as well. And so I just wanted to talk briefly about the role that our microbiologists play in working with clinicians to try and and uh, potentiate or make the best use um, of the different AMS uh, opportunities. So I'm not going to go through why AMS is so important. We've done that already today. Um, but as clinicians, an easy or more practical way is to think of how we can individually contribute to using antimicrobials more um, effectively. And there's the simplest way is to look at the four Ds of, of antimicrobial prescribing. And one is to choose the right drug, to choose to use it at the right dose, and then to de-escalate and to target the therapy once we know exactly which the organism is and the susceptibilities thereof, and then to choose it and to use it for the right duration of therapy. And that, so that's the simplest way to look at how we can do AMS day to day once you when you put your pen in your hand and you're prescribing patients uh, antimicrobials for, for for your patients. So how do uh, your um, microbiologists help you? Well, number one, you need to get to know them. They're very friendly people. If you don't, uh, I don't know how many of you actually know where the microbiology lab is as clinicians. I mean, apart from dropping samples of where the lab is itself, where our consultants' offices are, what the phone number is. I'm glad that I here put the phone number up for the for the pharmacists as well. Um, but take this number down. It's on the it's on the on the the, the CMS um, or the CM, the CMJH uh, medicine group. Um, so these are this is the normally man, man by the registrar who's on for the day and and can respond to any of your microbiological um, queries and are very 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 helpful. So then, how um, does the synergy really work? So number one, they can give you very good guidance as to what you should be doing before you even send the sample to the lab. So if you're not sure about uh, what you should be doing to send a school sample for cholera when we had. Our, our cholera, um, or we had that ongoing cholera outbreak, and you maybe had patients that you wanted to send samples for. Phone the microbiologist, ask them what they what you need to do, how quickly you need the sample to get there, whether there's any specific media you need to do, whether you need to be refrigerated, all those type of things. So number one, they help you a lot to determine exactly how samples should be taken and what media what and, and how they should be transported to the lab. Um, so this also helps a bit with diagnostic stewardship. So instead of sending a sample that's then going to get wasted, um, you're actually sending a sample for which you can get an accurate and useful result. They can also help you with, with provisional information. So with, this is most obvious when you get a blood culture that flags positive on the first day. They can do a gram stain and let you know what they are basically seeing. They don't yet have a specific ID, but they can already narrow down quite significantly what antimicrobials you could use empirically. So this helps a lot with uh, empiric therapy. So when you get a culture result, the, the, the idea and sensitivities are known, then we can de-escalate therapy and we can also then be more specific about how long we should treat for. Um, and and we obviously then have another opportunity to make sure we're giving the right doses. And it's especially useful where you have say multiple different organisms, maybe from different specimens that you wanted to find one antimicrobial that will cover. Um, so the microbiologists have a lot of extensive information um, and that this is a relationship we really should develop and, and use, but um, or to our own advantage, and it really makes your life as a clinician so much easier. So I just wanted to encourage you all to use that number to get to know our microbiologists, to go to the lab. You, they're always very free. You can just go down there and speak to them, take a sample, or take, take the, the, the HN number or the PMI number for the patient. Um, and you and it just makes your life so much so much easier. So I'll stop there, and I think um, I'll hand over to Sarah to tie things up. Um. So thank you very much to um all our speakers. Um. I hope you have um become aware of how important AMR is and what you can do to prevent it in you know the years coming forward so that when we're all old and gray and need an antibiotic there's still an antibiotic that we can get um you know this is all about me really um so uh, I also want to just say thanks very much to um Banse who's brought um a few snacks um from Sin uh, from Sanofi rare diseases if you'd like to come forward I don't know if you have anything to say today 
Um, and then uh, if, there, if there are any questions as well regarding the, the presentations. Um, I think one of the things that we see is that uh, we, we always think that, you know, the, the developed world, Europe and so on, are they're, they're the culprits for developing, you know, AMR and we're just suffering because we've, we've got it from them. But looking at the um, <laughs> the numbers that uh, Antoinette presented, you know, we are using far, far more carbapenems than they are using in Europe. And uh, I, I think there's an intervention there that needs to happen. Anyway, let me hand over to Bansi quickly. So I know we're running out of time, but 